navigate Antarctica with passengers as well. What really separates uh, Cork Expeditions from the other operators in these regions is that we only go to the polar regions. Uh, I know Jennifer mentioned a lot of other amazing areas in the world, but what makes Cork different is we are uncompromisingly polar. We are specialists in these regions and we are all based on small ships. We have five ships in our fleet, all under 200 passengers, so 132 passengers uh, up to 199. But now I'd like to introduce you one of our two amazing special guests that we have with us today. And I have known Lori Dexter, who will be sharing his screen shortly, for over the 12 years I've been at Cork Expeditions. And he is a mentor to many. Lori Dexter is here with us today. And he is a fellow of the Explorers Club a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, a member of the Arctic Club, and in recognition of his international contribution, the Canadian government has honored Laurie with the Order of Canada. So it is extremely a privilege to have Laurie with all of us here today to not only share his in-depth knowledge of the Canadian Arctic, but his own personal experience where he's lived and, and also been expedition leader. So please take it away, Lori. Okay, thank you. Is my screen showing? Is Yes, your screen is showing. And my voice. We see you. Yeah. We can't actually see your screen. You need to share that. Okay, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is obviously Canada, and Canada is enormous. <laughs> the second largest country in the world. Only Russia is bigger. But most people don't realize that Canada is almost as big north to south as it is east to west. And sorry, then, sorry, I'm going to interrupt. We can't see your screen. We can only see you. You can't see my screen? No. Okay. And uh, Laurie, maybe share at the bottom the share screen, the green arrow. Yeah, I'm looking for it. Okay, I can't see the green. I can't see it. Someone's mentioned they saw it. I can't see the uh, master. Oh, no. I can't see the master. Um, the toolbar. Yeah, I can't see a toolbar. Any suggestions? Do you, want, do you want me to jump into Greenland while Laurie's figuring out his, uh, his slides? I just want to say that when you push on the share screen, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So maybe Laurie's come in as a um, participant and that's why he can't share his screen. Laurie is a co-host. Um, actually, Alex, if you want to do the Greenland portion, that would be great. Sure. Hi, everyone. Alex here. I'll just uh, share my screen. You should be able to see it uh, now. Can someone confirm that you can see my screen? Yep. A map. Perfect. Yep. A map. Great. Well, my name is Alex McNeil. I've been working for Cork for almost 15 years. Uh, for many years as an expedition leader and guide, and I'm currently the director of Expedition Experience and Innovation. So that means I get to dream up new and exciting trips. And today I wanna to talk to you about uh, some new programs that we have in South Greenland. These are called the Greenland Adventure Voyages. And don't let the name scare you. They're as adventurous as you want them to be and uh, very much adventures of the heart, adventures of the spirit. Well, there's a picture of me, but you're looking at me on the screen anyway. So South Greenland's a, a little known destination. I think when we think of Greenland, a lot of images come to mind. But this is an incredible place to be. And here's uh, a map showing all the deep cutting fjords, which you're gonna see some lovely pictures of. And here's a satellite image. And you can see paired with those fjords is this immense uh, Greenland ice sheet, the, uh, the, the second largest ice mass in the world with, that cascades down to the sea. And all those dots in the ocean there are ice, icebergs and drifting sea ice that uh, most of which has come off of the, the Greenland ice sheet. It's a pretty diverse destination. There's some settlements around. The, the trips that we're offering here 
uh, starting in 2021 are uh, eight days long. So you can actually fly from North America, uh, from you know New York or San Francisco or Toronto to, to, to Reykjavik, and then on a Friday after work, and then on a Saturday get a, a charter flight from Reykjavik into Narsaswak, which is a former US uh, Air Force base, and then start your adventure, which finishes uh, the following weekend. And this is some of the scenery that you'll see. This is spectacular South Greenland here. And uh, one of the incredible parts of this experience is that it's going to be on board our new vessel, Ultramarine, which you'll be hearing all about. And I consider this, as someone who's been designing trips for Ultramarine around the Arctic and the Antarctic, I consider this to be Ultramarine's ultimate expedition. It brings out the best the ship has to offer and uh, is kind of the, the first of many innovative programs that we're going to be uh, putting out there on, on this beautiful ship. And it takes the, the core, a lot of the core experiences, which Quark has been running for 30 years, and then add some new ones that are, that are unique to this, to this program, to this region. And one of the ones I want to start on is heli hiking. So everyone on board will have the opportunity to use uh, one of our uh, twin engine H145 helicopters uh, to go out in small groups, you know, groups of 10 or so, uh, out into the, the wilderness here and uh, stretch your legs as much or as little as you want. And um, it's a great way for people of all ages, of all abilities uh, to get out into the wilderness and, uh, and soak it all in. And a great place to do that, this is actually Linden Fjord uh, from a, a trip that I did um, in August. And uh, just, you can see the fantastic scenery there, the, the cutting fjord and the ice streaming down. And uh, this, is a, this is a great destination that we would consider for, for heli hiking. Another big part about visiting Greenland is uh, the communities, the, the culture there, the, the Inuit and Greenlandic culture is such a feature of any trip to Greenland and South Greenland has some incredible communities, including Apilatok. In the picture on the right, you might have actually difficulty picking out that there's a community in that photo, but if you look right at the base of those mountains, you see just a smattering of these bright little houses. Um, and that is Apilatok, a community that we hope to visit. And, and this is uh, me and some of my teammates here uh, visiting the community um, last summer as we were preparing and, and developing this trip. And the people there are just so welcoming. It's just over 100 uh, residents and they're so excited to see visitors, so excited to, to perform and interact and just welcome people to their, to their community. Another experience that's part of this, it's an included part of this, is our paddle excursion experience which is a form of sea kayaking using inflatable uh, kayaks. So they're incredibly stable. Uh, you don't need to have any kayaking experience and there has never been anyone who's fallen out of these boats, um, but they're a great way to get up close and personal with some of the ice features and just relax in, uh, in the serenity of the environment and really take it all in. One of our uh, additional options that if, if people want to sign up for is our Greenland camp experience. And that's where we'll use the helicopters on this trip uh, to take a small group of people in to stay at this remote camp, uh, which is run by our partners at Testament Camp uh, in Greenland. And a big feature of this is going to be interacting with the local hosts um, who also have an incredible interest in food. And one of the activities will be foraging around the local landscape and uh, harvesting berries and herbs and putting those into some of the meals that you'll enjoy at the camp. Um, this experience would start around lunchtime and in and, and, and a given day and you'd spend the afternoon, the evening and the morning at the camp and then return to the ship the following day around lunchtime. And here's an example of some of the food that we've enjoyed there. Um, just really in, in, incredible that they can, they can whip up these kind of dishes in such a remote area. South Greenland has a rich history of, of cuisine. It's uh, one of the only uh, agricultural areas of the Arctic. They have sheep farms and they grow vegetables there. And of course, being right by the ocean, there's a lot of seafood. So there's an incredible uh, culinary journey that you can take there. Here's a picture of the tents that are there. And uh, imagine waking up to this view and just looking out uh, over the majesty of South Greenland. That camp is in Tashimut Fjord, and Tashimut Fjord uh, will be a destination for everyone on board the ship, not just those who go to the camp. And uh, it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, another place is, is Prince Christiansund, and this is an area that we would ship cruise. You can see the picture there on the right is of the ship sailing through 
the narrow fjord that kind of goes from east to west uh, along the, the southernmost point of South Greenland. And this is uh, an opportunity for guests to marvel at the, the navigation abilities of the captain and his, and his crew, uh, but also the beautiful scenery. We're really passionate about working with local people and this uh, expedition more than any other in Quark's portfolio and in fact the expedition industry overall is really engaged uh, with local partners. And so throughout this, this journey, any guests would have the opportunity to spend time with and get to know Greenlanders, uh, but also know that the voyage that they're taking is giving back to local communities and uh, being able to learn from and appreciate uh, local culture and history is really, really important part of the experience. And one um, structure that we've developed to help support that is called Tamasa, which in Greenlandic means you're, you're welcome or come on in. And often, uh, you know, many expedition trips will visit communities, uh, which we'll do on, on this trip, but we also developed a, a program where we would welcome the community members uh, on board for a kind of cultural fair where you'd be able to uh, experience Greenlandic food, music, some artists would come on board, some local leaders, politicians to talk about, um, to talk about their region to, to guests on board. So it's a great opportunity for even being a, a guest on a ship to reciprocate uh, the hospitality that the, the community and local people show to us as expedition visitors. Another experience that's included like the heli hiking with the uh, helicopters is the ice sheet experience. So flying up onto the Greenland ice sheet soaring above the uh, the waters there and actually landing and walking around on this incredible outer worldly um, feature which is uh, something really 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 special and you can see there you know just just stepping out of the helicopter and onto this kind of unfamiliar surface which by the way is not it's not slippery it's uh, it's and it's completely safe but uh, a very a very special experience that everyone would have the opportunity to participate in Another really interesting destination is Kasiarsak. As you move kind of inland from the coast and to the, the northwest of the South Greenland area, you have this rich agricultural area, which was uh, used you know, a thousand years ago by early settlers, especially the, the Vikings, the Norse Vikings. So you have this modern Greenlandic agricultural uh, element uh, alongside some historical Viking ruins. Another paid activity is the alpine kayaking. So this is using the helicopters uh, to take uh, participants in small groups up to some remote alpine lakes uh, to go for, for a paddle in either the morning or the, or the afternoon. And here's some examples of some of the places that you can go. And again, this is no experience required. Anyone can do this. The helicopters do all of the hard work. And once you're up there, you're just paddling around these you know, pristine, uh, bodies of water in, in complete serenity. You know, the helicopter leaves and you're there for, for you know, a couple hours if, you, if you'd like and uh, are just able to really soak it in and make the most of your time in South Greenland. For those who want a little bit more of an active adventure, we do have a mountain biking program that people can sign up to. And of course, we have, um, you know, our base activities of hiking and zodiac cruising. And one of the principal benefits of this program is it distributes everyone into small groups. So a 200 passenger ship, which Ultramarine is, is already really small and intimate. And then through these activities, you know, you're probably going to be out in a group of, you know, five to 10 people with a guide at a time. Um, so it's a really intimate experience. You really get to connect to the landscape. Um, a lot of the, the helicopter activities would be taking place uh, just at the beginning or end of, of meal times. So uh, if you're doing a conventional activity, you know, a Zodiac uh, enabled activity, you wouldn't have to worry about your experience being disrupted by helicopter noises. By the time majority of the people get out into their activities, the helicopters are shut down and you're really just surrounded by the, the peace and serenity. So this is a really exciting uh, uh, expedition that we've developed and we, we couldn't be, be you know, more thrilled to be bringing this uh, to the world and uh, think it brings out the best in, in, in ultramarine. To me, I touched on it, it's so important to, to involve the local people. And so this is an industry leading uh, community focused uh, trip that, uh, that has strong partnerships with the community members. This is my friend Kimmernack, uh, who's one of Greenland's leading uh, glacier guides. And so her and many others have been involved in, in developing this and will be involved in operating it once we, uh, once we bring it to life. 
also in times like this, I, you know, we're all locked up. I'm here in, in Toronto. We've just gone into, I think, our fourth lockdown. And, you know, what's really calling me, what's really keeping my spirit alive is the, the feeling that soon, sometime in the future, we'll be able to go back into these wild places and really recharge. I think South Greenland's going to be a great place to to do that, you know, to be able to disconnect from our screens, from our Zoom calls, as engaging as they are, and uh, find ourselves sitting in, in vistas like this. So this is uh, this is the last slide here, and I'll welcome Laurie to take over the, the screen sharing, if you can, while I wrap up. And uh, this is actually me wearing a passenger parka in our, in our uh, reconnaissance trip that we did. And this is the type of experience that everyone on board would be able to enjoy, regardless of ability, to be able to stand through the uh, efficiency of our helicopters on these remote peaks and uh, enjoy the serenity of South Greenland. So looking forward to welcoming any of you there in the future and hopefully answering some questions later in the, in the Zoom call here. But it looks like Laurie's screen is showing. We can see you, Laurie. Just push uh, start slideshow and uh, we'll let you take it away. Okay, I hope that's uh, working this time, is it? Yeah, it's working. You're all good, Laurie. Okay, thank you. Well, Great. I'll just repeat the first bit because it uh, helps to have the slides because most people don't realize that Canada is almost as big north to south as it is west to east. And very few people have ever had the privilege of being able to explore the vast richness of the very far north Canadian's Arctic. So that's our destination today. On April 1st, 1999, a significant change was made to the map of Canada. The huge area that was called the Northwest Territories was divided into two. The area in the West, it kept the name Northwest Territories. The area in the East took the name Nunavut, which in the language of the Inuit means our land. Now, as you know, Quark Expeditions offers many destinations, but today this is our focus, Nunavut. And when you tell your friends you're going on a trip to Nunavut, some may say, where? And when you tell them it's in the Canadian Arctic, they may say, why? There's nothing to see up there except snow and ice. So let's change their minds. Nunavut is a land with spectacular scenery. With Quark Expeditions, you'll be introduced to unique wildlife and to a land with people who've made a rapid transition from an age of isolated survival to sophisticated self-expression. Ah, the Arctic, a land of myth and mystery, a land with a gripping tale of history, ancient and modern. This is our destination. But first, I'll just uh, quickly go over what Cara said about Quark Expeditions. In 1991, Lars Wickender and Mike McDowell took the first group of commercial travelers to the North Pole by nuclear icebreaker. That was the inaugural voyage of Quark Expeditions. And that game-changing expedition, followed by the first ever tourism transit of the North East Passage, set Quark Expeditions on a course that would put it at the forefront of polar exploration. And since then, Quark has also taken more guests through the North West Passage than any other company. That leadership continues with the introduction of ultramarine, ultramodern, ultra-practical, and ultra-personal, because passenger capacity is kept to a ma maximum of 199. Just briefly, I'll tell you why I'm the person introducing you to Nunavut. My name is Laurie, and I lived in Nunavut and the subarctic for 45 years, including Pond Inlet and Arctic Bay. I've skied to both the North and South Poles and made numerous other ski, mountaineering and sled hauling expeditions in the Arctic as well as Antarctica. And more relevant, I worked as an expedition leader and a lecturer for Quark Expeditions and I made about 146 trips to Antarctica and about the same number to the Arctic. And I am delighted for this opportunity to invite you to my former home of Nunavut. So let's look at some of the wildlife that you might encounter. I know everyone wants to see polar bears. You want to see a polar bear, right? So let's show, let me show you a polar bear. Can you see it? It's here in this picture. 
see this rock? Let me make that rock bigger. And now, can you see the polar bear? Just that tiny bit of fluff. We were just cruising along the shore in our zodiacs and we didn't see it at first. And suddenly there it was in the open, eating the remains of a seal. Now, can you see that rock still? That's the rock I just showed you. It doesn't look big enough to have hidden it moments before. So yeah, we do see polar bears on our trips, but they can also be elusive. So while we can't guarantee any wildlife encounters, it would be unusual not to see a polar bear. In fact, I remember one or two exceptional trips when we saw more than 30. Well, we know these are what everyone wants to see, but not to split hairs about it. We also have Arctic hares. Yeah, I, I know, I, I apologize, that's a very bad joke. Well, on one occasion, we were on a hike and a guest suddenly got excited and said, Laurie, look, there's a polar bear on the hillside in front of us. When I looked, it was an Arctic hare. In these vast landscapes, distances and sizes are deceiving. A white object could very well have been a polar bear. At opposite ends of the scale, we have big shaggy musk oxen and tiny furry lemmings. Lemmings are hard to spot because they're quick and well camouflaged with the tundra. On one occasion, we were with a, a small group on a hike in a, a safe spot on the tundra when a group of musk oxen came galloping past and we could actually feel the ground shudder under us. Other well-known Arctic animals are caribou, the Arctic fox, and the more elusive Arctic predator, the wolf. There's a wonderful amount of wildlife in the ocean. Walrus may be found on rocks or on floating pieces of sea ice, and there are five species of seal commonly found in Nunavut, and of course, a variety of fish. Then there's whales, including orcas, which have the wildest world distribution of any whale, and belugas, which sailors in wooden ships in the old days they used to call them sea canaries because they're constantly chirping away and they could hear the noise through the hulls of their ships. And perhaps the most exotic of the whales, narwhals, with their incredible ivory tusks. And on a special occasion, maybe even a bullhead whale. It may not be obvious from the part you see above the surface, but these creatures are huge. Then there's birds. Sometimes we cruise in our zodiacs along the base of towering cliffs that are just covered in guillemots and razorbills. And there are dozens of different species of bird, land birds and seabirds. Here's four of my favorites, the ptarmigan, snow geese, snowy owl, and the amazing Arctic tern. Now a few Arctic terns have the longest migratory flight of any bird in the world because they breed up here in the Arctic and then they fly all the way to Antarctica to feed during their non-breeding cycle. And as for those people who think the Arctic is just snow and ice, well, let's take a walk on the tundra. There are some rocky barren areas. I'll show you some in a moment. But in the summer, there are vast areas of tundra that burst into life. Our guests are given the opportunity to experience the tundra according to their own abilities as we offer three levels of walking led by our expedition staff. You can have a little stroll near the landing site, a casual intermediary walk, and then a longer hike for the really keen walkers. Now, it isn't a greenhouse, but as you look carefully, you can see myriads of colorful flowers and mosses, liverworts, and lichens that in addition to being beautiful, help us understand climate change. Well, as you can see, there's a lot to take in, but to help us understand, the expedition team always includes specialists who give presentations during the trip and who accompany you driving zodiacs and leading walks on the shore. We have an ornithologist who explains the lifestyle of the birds we encounter. We have a biologist who has the task of teaching us about animals and mammals of both land and sea, and then rocks, mountains, tundra, and valleys carved out by glaciers are the home of all the wildlife and vegetation that we see. And our geologist explains the millions of years that have produced this environment. 
The realm of the historian covers 6,000 years of indigenous inhabitants that have come and gone and come again, and tales of daring do and accounts of exploration successes and disasters. The lecturers and other staff on Quark's exhibition team are all highly qualified in their various fields, and they come from all over the world. They love their work, and many have been with Quark for many years. So now let's move on to visit some typical locations. Here's an overview of the Arctic. Now we're going to choose just one small area of Nunavut known as Lancaster Sound. Let me make that a bit bigger. We'll start at Beachy Island, then sail to Port Leopold. Don't get excited. It's not a port with big cruise ships or shopping centers. And after that, we head for Dundas Harbor and finish with the Inuit community of Arctic Bay. I'll never forget the first time we sailed into the harbor of Beachy Island. I knew that when Sir John Franklin was searching for the Northwest Passage, his two ships spent their first winter at Beachy Island. So I guessed they must have chosen a really pretty attractive location. So into the bay we sailed. This was on a small ship in the mid nineties, long before the sophistication of ultramarine. I was shocked. It's the most barren, inhospitable bay imaginable. Now, I know I made a big deal a moment ago about the beauty of the Arctic tundra, and that is true, but this place is different. These are the graves of some of the men from Franklin's ships 175 years ago. No one visits these desolate graves and comes away the same. Young men, they left home with health, high hopes, and thrilled with a sense of adventure. And here they lie. I've seen our guests landing here with laughter, but by the time they've walked the short distance from the shoreline to these graves, laughter has turned to tears. It's not surprising that the Inuit name for Beach Island is Iluvialuit, the place of graves. On more than one occasion, even in the height of summer, I've seen it like this. You know, I actually prefer it this way. It gives you a more realistic feel for what it was like for Franklin and his men. And of course, uh, you recognize the bright quark parkas. And with the yellow quark parkas, we are dressed to be comfortable in conditions like this. In 1981, the graves were exhumed, the bodies photographed, and small samples taken for analysis. Since then, a forensic artist has produced portraits of what these young men probably looked like. John Torrington, age 20. William Brain, age 32. John Hartnell, age 25. How can anyone not be moved to visit this lonely grave site? But there's more. Further along the shore, we find the remains of an old building. It was called Northumberland House and it was built by one of the ships searching for the lost Franklin expedition. Now, there's lots of interest in this area, but one of the exciting discoveries for me may not seem so exciting for you. It was old rusty tin cans. Now, I was aware that some researchers had made a connection with the early canning of food and possible lead poisoning. And here I saw how the cans were made by using a soldered seal of lead, which must have gradually contaminated the food inside. And that in turn may have led to mental confusion in some of the decisions made by the early explorers. So are you, are you as excited as me now? From Beachy Island, it isn't far to another remote and desolate location, Port Leopold. Now, do not get the wrong idea when I use words like desolate or remote. They, these are not negative words. Indeed, this is why these northern trips are so powerful. And this is Port Leopold. Sorry, no cruise terminal. The Arctic vistas can be intimidating. Landing by Zodiac in a vast treeless landscape, it can be overwhelming. Visitors may in fact suffer from sensory deprivation. Most people are accustomed to high buildings that block out the sky. 
the noise of traffic, crowds of people, and the smells of a city. Suddenly they're in a wide open space with none of that stimulation. And it can make you uneasy. That is being sensory deprived. In reverse, when Inuit and other people who live in the Arctic come south from wide open landscapes, they often suffer from sensory overload because of all the noises, limited views and crowds of people. You know, I remember when we moved from the treeless high Arctic to this house in Fort Smith, which was surrounded by trees, which our children weren't accustomed to. And I remember they came to us in the night. There's a scary sound, they said. When we checked it out, it was the wind blowing in the trees. Back to Port Leopold. In 1849, the Royal Navy sent two ships to look for the lost Franklin expedition. They were the Enterprise and Investigator. They spent the winter here frozen in the ice and they left a record that still survives. A rock with the letters E and I, Enterprise and Investigator, and the year 1849. I hope you can appreciate the power of this symbol. Each time I've been here, I crouch and try to imagine the weather-beaten hands with a hammer and chisel carving into this rock. And I try to picture the men in two ships trapped in the ice, trying to survive in this bleak land that was so foreign to them, wondering if they will ever see home and loved ones again. Many years later, in 1926, the Hudson's Bay Company built a small outpost here because they thought it was central and uh, would be a good place to trade for furs with the Inuit, but it was just too remote and it had to close down the next year. It's a tough environment. Strangely, the Inuit called this trading post Sirkinuk, which means the sun. I don't know why. Perhaps it was derogatory, perhaps just their sense of humor, because this place is very close to where I lived in Arctic Bay, and in winter, the sun sets in November and isn't seen again until February. So they called it the sun. <laughs> but there's a fascinating addition. Further along the shoreline, we find the remains of Thule houses. And Gwen, our local Inuit guide, is holding a section of a bone sled runner. The Thule people are the ancestors of Gwen and of all of today's Inuit, who lived in quite successfully in this harsh environment while the European explorers were suffering from scurvy and many of them dying. This then is Port Leopold, a place with many stages of history. The Thule people for hundreds of years, the explorers for a few decades, the Hudson's Bay Company for one year, and now you and me for a few hours. From Port Leopold, let's sail across Lancaster Sound and head for Dundas Harbor. At Dundas Harbor, we're introduced to a different part of Northern history, sovereignty, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, law and order. But first, we need to take just a very quick look at the sequence of events leading up to this. The early explorers returned home with reports of seas teeming with wildlife, especially whales. And this led to fleets of whaling ships coming to the Arctic and committing wholesale slaughter. It wasn't long before traders arrived, the Hudson's Bay Company being the chief among them. They were primarily interested in skins, in fur. Along with the whalers and traders came missionaries in the Western Arctic, mainly Roman Catholic priests, and in Nunavut, they were mainly Anglican. The Hudson's Bay Company sometimes boasts that the letters HBC stand for here before Christ. But if they did predate the missionaries, it wasn't by much. All of these police, whalers, traders, missionaries, they left their mark. Everywhere we go, we are aware of their influence. So back to Dundas Harbour. After the Canadian government began to take a serious interest in its sovereignty over the Arctic, RCMP officers were sent to establish remote stations. This base was manned twice, 1924 to 1933 and 1945 to 1951, and the buildings are still standing. 
Considering it's 70 years since the outpost was abandoned, the buildings are in remarkably good condition, including the outhouse. Oh my goodness, there's so much to tell about this station, with Inuit families being brought here and tales of long dog sled patrols, but we don't have time, so I'll mention just one thing. Can you see something white on the hillside behind the buildings? It's a white picket fence around a graveyard. Two of these graves have a story to tell. The one on the right is for Constable Mazenov, who died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound on June 16, 1926. He was due to leave on the relief ship in August. Tragedy visited again the following August, just before the annual return of the supply ship, Con Constable Stevens accidentally shot himself while hunting walrus. There's so much more to do and see at Dundas Harbour. There are many remains from the Thule culture, old graves, animal traps, the remains of old houses, bones from hunting, especially bowhead whales and walrus. These are the remains of a Thule settlement. As mentioned previously, the ancestors of the people still living in the Arctic. One of my favourite things to do is to lead a walk along the peninsula. Occasionally, I'll stop and say, what do you see? Our guests look around and don't see much of interest. Then I'll point out a barely visible ring of stones that once held down a tent, or I'll show them a bone and explain how the Thule people hunted large bowhead whales, or invite them to sit in a small hollow in the ground or among what looks like a pile of rocks and welcome them into a centuries old living room. It's a powerful emotional link to the past. The Inuit name for Dundas Harbour demonstrates their sense of humour again. It's Tadluruti, which means a woman's chin with tattoos on it. It's a name derived from the gullies and streaks on Devon Island, which from a distance resemble the traditional chin tattoos. We need to be careful at Dundas Harbour, as everywhere. We often have the thrill of seeing musk oxen. To be fair, we usually see them further away, which actually is the preferred and safer way. There's always the probability of polar bears everywhere. I remember on one occasion, there was a mother and cub close to our landing beach here at Dundas Harbour, so we couldn't go ashore. We don't go ashore if a polar bear is there. But then the mother and cub began to walk away along the shoreline, and we followed them in our zodiacs. Later, we were able to make our landing using appropriate precautions with staff armed with rifles. Our expedition team always includes staff who are not only trained to handle firearms, but who are trained to recognize polar bear behavior. Our final special treat before we leave Dundas Harbor. Here, high on a cliff behind the houses, there's a deer falcon nest. And on a few occasions, we've been lucky to see a deer falcon. For me, this is a highlight. And of course, our birders need to be sedated afterwards. So far, we've been looking at abandoned sites, but now we're going to meet the people of the land, the Inuit, in the village of Arctic Bay. The people you will meet may live in extreme isolation, but they are modern and knowledgeable. Do not be surprised if a traditional carver talks to you about his trip to give an art demonstration last year in Tokyo or maybe Dubai. I remember one man who was a traditional hunter who still preferred to use a dog team rather than snowmobiles. And one day he decided to take one of those around the world travel passes. I don't think he stopped in any country. He just kept going from one airport to another. Why? Well, why not? He just wanted to fly around the world. Back to Arctic Bay. This is a, a beautiful little community that blends modern sophistication with many aspects of a more traditional lifestyle. When I lived there, it had a population just over 400. Today, it's a major metropolis with about 900 people. It has satellite communication with the world and hunters often carry a satellite phone with them. Modern communications are a part of life. People have good housing, well insulated and built to withstand winter storms. The school is also well equipped and computers and iPads are integral to the educational system. 
They have a northern store, some other smaller shops, a modern health center, a recreation center, a church, and lots of other facilities. And just about everyone has a snowmobile, and many have trucks or cars, and you know, you can, you can always go shopping with your four-wheeler. For the three brief months without sea ice, many have high-powered boats. And when we reach shore, the kids come swarming all around our zodiacs and jumping in and out of them. And of course, it's a delight for us to meet the children. They also may have some of their elders in traditional dress greet us as we arrive, and perhaps their throat singers. If you've never heard throat singing, you will be astonished at the rhythmic guttural sounds they make as a duet. They might offer you some pan-cooked bannock or deep-fried bannock, and they might also offer you some muktuk, the skin of the beluga or narwhal, which was once a very important part of their diet because it's high in vitamin C. Sometimes when we visit, the young athletes give us a demonstration of their incredibly agile Inuit games. Or they may give a demonstration of cleaning a seal skin, and local artists may give you the opportunity to buy a carving. You notice I've been saying they may do this or that, because we don't always know exactly what they will provide during our visit. But one thing I can, can tell you, they always put on a good show. This tiny, isolated community, it knows how to host visitors. I hope you recognize this visitor. How would you like a selfie with Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau? And here is a gentleman sipping a good old English cup of tea. Well, I guess Arctic Bay cup of tea. It is, of course, Prince Charles when he and Camilla visited this community. Now, I want you to notice something. Something that's not there. You'll note the lack of security agents and bodyguards. You can travel in Nunavut without fear. And while talking about traveling without fear, it's worth mentioning that Quark is fully conscious of all COVID restrictions and will have industry leading technology on board. No one knows what the situation will be three months, six months, or a year from now. But be assured, Quark will continue to monitor the ever changing situation in order to provide the safest possible experience. One thing that sets Quark a cut above the others is that in addition to normal Zodiac operations, the Ultramarine has helicopters. Not only that, but it has two helidecks. I've worked on quite a few icebreakers actually, with, which have helicopters, but always with only one helipad. Having two independent helipads makes a huge difference to efficiency. Helicopters let you explore areas far from the ship and to experience mind-blowing scenery. Yes, this is Nunavut. And you gain a whole new perspective. This is a photograph I took from a helicopter. And can you see our ship? Gives you some idea of scale. People get a thrill just by seeing the ship from the air. Not only that, but many people have never been on a helicopter. So that in itself is a special experience. And it's the helicopters that enable us to make landings in otherwise inaccessible places. Some of my most rewarding experiences have been either helicopter sightseeing or making remote landings on ice fields or in deep tundra valleys. This is where Quark is a leader in the industry. Not only is it an added dimension, but it provides greater safety. As an expedition leader, I have often used the ship's helicopter for general reconnaissance or to check out a landing to make sure it's safe from polar bears. Let me finish with the most important thing about the Canadian Arctic and Nunavut. It has scenery, it has wildlife, it has history, but most of all, it has people. Some of the elders who are still alive were born in igloos or summer tents. The Inuit face many challenges, but their ancestors have survived well for many centuries, and I believe they will continue for many more. Quark Expeditions is honored 
and proud to have the privilege of working alongside our Northern family. And also for this opportunity to introduce you today to Nunavut in Canada's Arctic. Thank you. Oh, wow, Lori, thank you so much. That was absolutely incredible. And now I cannot wait to go and explore other areas of the Arctic, especially uh, Nunavut. Uh, just to recap with everyone today, we have nine day itineraries going into these areas, um, as well as in, in, with uh, Greenland, with Alex was sharing with South Greenland, so such short trips. Um, again, the Canadian Arctic, little as nine days going in and out of Toronto. And I know we're running out of time today, but this is a very special 12 day itinerary, um, ex including Axel Heiberg and Ellesmere Island, some of the most beautiful places on the planet, all leaving again and departing from right from Toronto. If you want to explore Greenland and the Canadian Arctic, there are also 17 day opportunities and, and Baffin Island really highlighting that as well. So I just wanted to share a little bit of, of what we had today. So thank you so much. Do we have any um, questions, Annabelle and Jennifer? Actually, we have a ton of questions. So yeah. I'm gonna try to get to them all being really respectful of everybody's time. First off, a couple of people have messaged me privately asking about a recording of this presentation. Um, and yes, everybody who is RSVP'd will get a link to the recording in a few days, probably not until early next week, but we will send that out. A lot of people have um, just said, thank you, Lori, because you really did yeah. your story and put us in destination. Yeah. I think Excellent. I should put on my winter jacket now because I feel cold after yours. <laughs> um, but here are some questions that have come up in the chat. And I, I'm gonna read this first one. I'm not sure what this person means. It's from P. Crafty. What are the regulations for cruise ships in Canada for 2021 and 2022? Now, I'm not sure if they're talking about COVID. This is the question, and I'm just gonna hand that over to you, Kara. Yeah, I think what's uh, everything going on with the restrictions in the Canadian Arctic, I think Alex is on our task force and would know a lot about this as well. But right now we're really monitoring the situations because we want everyone to be safe, not only our ship crew, but also the residents in Nunavut, as well as all of our guests that are on board. So definitely we're closely monitoring that for this upcoming um, Arctic season and beyond. Yeah, I'll just touch on it quickly, Kara. So um... Yeah, the vaccination process in Nunavut is moving forward, uh, you know, very, very well. Uh, the Transport Canada has actually issued an extension of a, of a cruise break until February of 2022, but they're going to be reconsidering along the way. Um, and definitely on behalf of Cork, we're not going to be running any trips if there's uh, an unnecessary risk to our travelers or the local communities. So uh, we're going to be working with the, the government and uh, they haven't mentioned anything about 2022 yet, but we'll be keeping everyone well informed. And as I said, things are progressing positively, especially in, in Nunavut, where there's been very uh, little um, COVID risk. So uh, great, great question for the times and hopefully that answers it appropriately. Actually, that answered a couple questions. So um, I'm going to move on to the next topic. Somebody's asked about the ships. Isn't, and I'm going to assume this is the ocean, isn't it more bouncy that can cause vomiting? Like what are the incidents of seasickness? Do you guys carry medication? Yeah. Lori's done the most trips out of all of us. So I'll pass it to you, Lori. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the smaller the ship, the, the more motion you're likely to get. But this ship, it does have stabilizers. Uh, for its size, it's one mm -hmm. of the most stable ships. And in any case, we have good drugs. <laughs> 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 and it's true. I mean, with, with, with modern medication, you can, you don't have to get sick. Uh, in inevitably, some people are more susceptible than others. And, uh, but seasickness is one of those, it's one of the worst things you would experience, but it's also one of the best because unlike anything else, uh, it clears up very quickly. And after the first day or so on the ship, you'll be just fine. And, and once, once, it's not like many other sicknesses where you feel ill and weak for a long time afterwards. The instance it's it's over, it's over. 
Yeah. Uh, speak for yourself, Lori. I get seasick all the time. Oh, no. For the counter drug, it's a little patch. It goes behind your ear. It's about the size of your littlest fingernail, and it lasts for three days, and it disperses the medication over those three days, and you can shower and swim with it. I highly recommend that. <laughs> Yeah. The other thing I'll add just quickly on these destinations is uh, the Canadian Arctic and South Greenland are very well protected. You spend mm -hmm. the majority of your yeah. time in sheltered fjords and passages. Yeah. So uh, I I've never witnessed um, any significant seasickness on a Canadian Arctic voyage. Th those are yeah. more for the long ocean crossing mm -hmm. voyages. Uh, yeah. that's the rest. Or the Drake. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point, Alex, because I'm like you, Annabelle, I get seasickness even just on a little boat when it's super flat, you know, on a little sailboat. Um, but in these areas, like Alex is saying, you're in such of these deep fjords with a lot of the itineraries that we're talking about, not open water, that if any of you are, are really prone to seasickness, uh, the fjords are very sheltered, as Alex was saying, so it makes for a pleasant uh, experience. Yeah, for sure. Now we're on to flights. Jen, you might want to answer this next one. Do flights to Greenland only come in from Iceland and can we fly in directly from North America? Um, right now, the only ones that are coming in are from uh, Iceland or from Denmark because Greenland is part of Denmark. So we don't have anything from North America. So you have to fly into Reykjavik or into Copenhagen. Thank you. Do you do trips in September to see the Northern Lights? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I thought so. Um, yeah. What is the visa process? The what process? The visa process. Um, well, if you're a Canadian, you don't need any visas, but that's one thing that your agent will look after before you go, because things can change, especially with COVID. You might need this COVID passport if we get it. So that would be checked when you when you book and before you go. But for Greenland and Canada's north, you don't need a visa with a Canadian or American passport or most Europeans. Um, you would need a, a ETA for Canada if you're European though. Um, but that's something that we can go through with you. Yeah, and essentially too, within terms of flights, um, a lot of the itineraries that we spoke about uh, with the Canadian Arctic and Canadian Arctic with Greenland, you're essentially in your own travel bubble because they are chartered flights with Cork Expeditions. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you're arriving in Toronto and going to your hotel and embarking the ship with your fellow passengers, uh, you're essentially creating your own bubble for these types of itineraries, which is great. Mm -hmm. What is the best month of travel and what's the temperature at that time? Hey. I'll, I'll speak to South Greenland and then pass over to, to Lori for Canada. But uh, so we, our trips are operating in July, which is we've picked strategically uh, because that's an amazing time of year. You know, in, in May in South Greenland, it still can be quite windy, which can interfere with the helicopter and flight operations. In June, there can be more bugs around, but those are usually gone by July. And then you have this perfect time where you have a great weather window and the temperatures are actually quite warm in South Greenland because it's it's uh, in the southern part of the, the, the main area of Greenland. And so average temperatures would be between five and 15 degrees above zero Celsius. Um, before I pass over to Laura, the other thing I'll mention just on Northern Lights is uh, some of our Canadian Arctic trips do take place in September and uh, you would have some opportunities for Northern Lights on, on those departures. But over to you, Laurie, for time of year in the Canadian Arctic. Yeah, the, the Canadian Arctic has more ice than over in, towards Greenland and it doesn't finally break up until July. So all the trips up there, you really have only three months of open water, July, August and September. Yeah. Uh, July itself is, is still a little bit uh, tricky with ice. So most of our trips take place in August and September. Temperatures, mm -hmm. same as what Alex said, between five and 15 degrees. Um, 10 is a normal summer day. Um, I've, it's not usually more than 15 degrees, but it, it can be, uh, but you, uh, a lot of, a lot of sunshine. Thank you. How far in advance do you have to book one of these types of trips? Jennifer? Well, usually with the expedition, it's traditionally done. People like to book up to two years in advance. Um, and with what's happened with COVID, a lot of the trips for 2022 are really full. And if 2021 is officially canceled um, by some companies or will be canceled, then a lot of people will be moving to the next year. So 
yeah, I really believe as soon as the trips come out, you should try to book. You get a better selection of cabins. There's usually always an early bird discount and uh, you get the trip you want, you get the cabin you want. And um, there's so many flexible booking policies out there now and um, low, lower deposits. Um, so different companies offer different things. So Kara, if you wanna address the booking conditions right now, and yeah, absolutely. Um, because we do have some space on our 2022 departures. Like Jennifer is saying, um, people are booking more in advance or their trips are shifting from one year to another. One big trip is shifting to another year. And so Cork Expeditions has wonderful early booking bonuses like Jennifer was talking about. So even up to 30% off if you book by the end of May of this May of 2021. So a lot of people are booking in advance. So please chat with Jennifer and Jennifer can always uh, grab me as well to chat more in depth about certain itineraries we've spoken about today or certainly other areas even like Antarctica. Yeah and just saying that we are offering the 300 US dollars per person onboard ship credit and um, so if you have questions yeah you can reach out to me but or your merit expert um, that you deal with. For and sure. Quark Expeditions now also books in Canadian dollars, which really helps. Oh, I'm, yeah. Even though we're a U.S.-based company, I'm located in Toronto. I booked a big trip to Africa in U.S. dollars, oh, so I know how much it hurt and it hurt me. So we do have Canadian pricing now, too, for all the Canadians on the line, as well as U.S. pricing for all of the Americans. Um, Arctic Adventures, is this suitable for children or is it adults only? I can well, take that, Kara. Or yeah. yeah, great. I think it's a great trip for children. I mean, we take uh, people over the age of eight um, and I've been working in the field with many families and it's a, it's a wonderful experience for families to share together. And some of the trips we've designed like the Greenland Adventure Voyages are intended for kind of multi-generational families. So you can use the helicopters and everyone from children to grandparents can go and look out on vistas like the one I, I showed you. Um, we, we have uh, activities that, that help kids burn off energy, you know, going for hikes and going ashore in the Zodiacs is, uh, is really great for that. So it's, it's definitely family friendly. It's not a Disney cruise, but uh, there's a lot of opportunities for, for kids to enjoy the experience. That's a really great point, Alex, because my Greenland trip in 2016, I was on board with an 86 year old who didn't get off the ship once and she loved maneuvering through the icebergs and looking at the beautiful mountain ranges and the wildlife from the comfort of the vessel. But on that same trip, I was with a 60 year old and his 18 year old daughter because he brought her for a graduation present from high school. And they were able to go off and do hiking like Alex was saying and things like that. So there is a little something for everybody on our trips as active or as um, or as leisure as you'd like your trip to be. Yeah, and that's for sure, both ends. The older they are, the, the more they appreciate it. I really feel that and I remember it. And can you tell us a little bit about the ships, how environmentally friendly they are? Because obviously the places that you're going to are extremely sensitive. I can answer that, Kara. Yeah. One of the things we're super excited about with Ultramarine is it's gonna be a, a one of a kind ship <laughs> technology such as, um, it's going to be self-sufficient from a waste perspective insofar as the, the discharge will all be treated. And we have a system on board called a MAGS or micro auto gasification system. So all of the garbage is incinerated and it creates biochar, like actually fertilizer. Um, so it's a, it's a really environmentally friendly ship. As far as emissions, uh, it's got one of the lowest fuel consumptions of, of any ship with uh, I think the lowest per passenger emissions uh, of any ship that we've had in our, our fleet. So it's a really environmentally friendly way to travel. And if it, people do want more information, please read it to Jennifer and Merritt because we did become, um, we came up with a wonderful Polar Promise, a huge sustainability initiative and it's public. So I love how a lot of travelers now are becoming even more environmentally conscious in their choices. And a lot of people, when they travel to the polar regions with Cork Expeditions, they really do come back as polar ambassadors. Uh, Lori was mentioning our amazing expedition team and everyone uh, in their field and everyone is definitely conscious about the environment and the places in which we visit. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple questions about the single supplement policy. A, do you match people up? Or B, what is the, um, I guess, supplement that you have to pay for a single traveler? 
Yeah, what's wonderful now is with our new ultramarine and a couple of other vessels in our fleet, we have solo cabins. Uh, so there are solo cabin pricing. In the event that those aren't available or maybe they're sold out or another ship, we do pair uh, travelers that are solo uh, with another uh, gender of, of them. So if there's a, a female that's traveling, we can easily pair them up with another solo female traveler. Uh, and what's neat is you'll find like-minded individuals on this trip with what Jennifer was talking about at the beginning about expedition travel travel in general. I love the diversity of people on board. And if you do come alone, that you'll meet so many people from around the world. Okay, and this is the last question. And I think we're going to cut it off after this one. Um, that somebody's interested in seeing both Viking settlements. Is that possible on a trip? Or are they both very similar? It wouldn't matter if you only got to see one. Um, yeah, I guess that's a question for South Greenland with the Viking settlements. It's there's actually thousands of them scattered around the landscapes of South Greenland. So uh, we were talking. There's a UNESCO World Heritage site down there that's designed around these this Viking heritage, and he was really excited actually that we were going to be coming with helicopters on board because he said there's probably a chance that you'll be flying around and you'll discover a never before known Viking ruin. And so he was really excited about that. So I anticipate on that trip that there'll be multiple uh, points throughout the, the journey where uh, we'll be visiting some, some Viking sites. The, the, the main ones, you know, uh, Bratlud, which was Eric the Red's settlement, Eric the Red's farm, uh, who was Leif Erikson's father, the, the, the Viking that made it all the way to, uh, to North America. Um, that's in, in Kassiarsuk, that was the, the ruin that I showed. So there's plenty of Viking history opportunities in South Greenland. Yeah. Okay. I think that wraps it up for the questions. Um, I want to thank the Quark team and Jen for such a great presentation. Uh, and thank you all of the listeners out there who stuck with us till the end. Um, if you're interested in more travel, traveling with us virtually, we do have another one coming up shortly on Ireland, where we're going to take you to a um, farm, as well as talk to you about different tours that we offer offer there. So thanks again, everybody. 